and welcome to the Aotearoa Rugby Pod Rugby World Cup final week. The All Blacks against South Africa, the two greatest teams in Rugby World Cup history, arguably the greatest rivalry in rugby history, probably as deep a respect as can run between two countries in a sport. It's going to be an absolutely huge test match, the first time they've met in the final since 1995, which seems like a travesty to me that these two teams have taken so long since they got there. So we're going to get into that. We're going to see how the box got over England. What was so good about the All Blacks as they threw aside Argentina? We'll also have a look at a few questions from our viewers, the North versus South debate and why the Southern Hemisphere teams were so good in knockout footy and continue to be so good in knockout footy despite the rankings. We'll also have a quick look at the WXV as well, the first weekend of that competition down here in New Zealand. So with no further ado, James Parsons. Hello. Yes, what a week. Oh, it's a great weekend of footy. Um, that was a clinical, clinical uh, display by the All Blacks and I look forward to getting stuck into it with, with our old mate Brynner here. Yeah, coming in from Japan, Bryn Hall. Must have been really, really good sitting in Japan watching that game thinking, what, what time in the morning was it? Four in the morning? Yeah, it was four in the morning our time. So, um, yeah, very similar to the week before getting up at that time. But look, I think, man, we'll, we'll go into it. But I think we're heading in the right direction going into a final. You're talking around teams that are, that are building nicely. I think, you know, we're pretty much at a point where you'd want to be in a final with the results that we've had um, with the quarterfinal and the semi final. So, um, South Africa, we'll touch on that. But I think for them, it's probably the best thing that's happened to them, I think, getting out of that the way that they did. Um, we'll go into a little bit deeper, but I think, um, you know, there's from hearing from my father, the All Blacks seem to have better favourites over there. But in saying that, I think um, South Africa with Rusty, we're having a great mindset around um, the South Africans this week and building them up with, um, you know, a few pitches around around their, their media room or team room, I reckon. They're world number one, they're reigning world champions, and they know how to get things done. I can't see New Zealand being the favourite going into this game. No, I, I can see why people are jumping on that bandwagon though a little bit. Like the, the clinical display, the lack of errors, the defence that they've shown, um, their game's just gone from strength to strength throughout this whole competition and, and they can score points. You know, like they, they, they are electric on attack. You know, look at Will Jordan, three tries on the weekend, probably should have been four. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but look, they, they're, they're in red hot form um, and if they can produce what they did in the semi final, I, I think they're worthy of that favourite tag. Mm. What did you like the most about the way the All Blacks went about their business against Argentina when thinking about how that could work? against the Springboks in a final? I suppose what I like is the opportunities, I think, nine entries into the 22, seven tries. Beautiful. That, that you, you're coming away with points most, most so the discipline on defence as well. Um, their ability to just make tackle after tackle and just weren't even, even when they were miles ahead, they were not prepared to concede tries. Mm. Um, I think defence will win this World Cup and, and, and they seem to be finding their shape really nicely. Mm. What about you, Bren? What do you think? Again, I think in the very first game in the, the quarterfinal stage, sorry, against uh, against Ireland, you know, they had turnovers very early on that kind of set the tone defensively for, for the All Blacks. And again, on the weekend, within the first 20 minutes, they had three turnovers, you know, been able to stunt that momentum of the Argentinians, who I thought, you know, in that first five, 10 minutes, even with Borfelli, um, his first penalty, they were able to build pressure and been able to um, ask a lot of questions of the All Blacks defensively in terms of phases, but we were able to get turnovers in crucial moments in that early period. So, um, yeah, I thought it was really, really good. And considering that um, we've talked around their defence and um, the kind of worries that I did have, again, their connection was really, really great around decision-making and then the, the wide channels and then also our turnover work and being able to uh, build um, pressure from getting those um, getting those jackal turnovers. One thing I found interesting was, you know, Argentina in those first couple of channels flew out of the line in defence. Their big loose forwards did an amazing job there. And the All Blacks, unlike they hadn't before, handled that very well. I would think if you looked at last year or the year before that, that was where they're coughing up balls, their tip passes are going wrong, and they're going backwards. Yeah, they, they were very patient on attack, and they just created that depth by probably slowing their foot speed, Bryn. You know, like it wasn't about just being deeper. They're just slowing their foot speed and, and their ability to sort of release those balls out the back and, and then find the space on the edge. Like we, we spoke about Argentina been a little bit loose around the ruck and probably over committing at the breakdown and they did probably do that a couple of times and got penalised for it but they actually tightened their defence up really well and the All Blacks you know sort of reacted to that and, and found that, that, that width I suppose mm. that width in their game and 
um, you know, and those big boys had to do a little bit of work first, as you said, you know, in that first 20 minutes, it was, it was a bit of an arm wrestle, but then they just sort of took over from there. What do you mean by slowed their footwork? Yeah. I suppose it's like, you know, if you if you run fast into something, you're going to shut down your own time and space. Yeah. So it's almost just a little bit more patient, um, taking less steps and I suppose starting your run later so that you're not shutting down your time and space so you can see the full picture and then obviously uh, find the space wherever it may be. Yeah, something there, bro. The longer that Joe Smith's been in this in this team, I believe, around that breakdown work, I mm. think, you know, you look at Shannon Frizzell's tries, the, the multi-phases of being able to hold onto the ball for long periods of time and being efficient at that breakdown for long periods of try. You look at that try just before half uh, just before half time, that really kind of sealed uh, sealed that match, I thought, early in that, um, the back end of the first half. Boys have been able to go over the advantage line, quick cleans, and been able to ask questions of their Argentinian defence. So probably 12 months ago, the questions that you were talking around just now, Ross, around the, the tip balls not hitting the right person, mistakes, not winning that clean breakdown. Um, we weren't able to get those long phases, but we are trending in the right direction. We've done that against Ireland in that quarter final, and then now we've done it against um, Argentinians. But it's going to go up another level because you know that breakdown area with the South Africans. Even when the bomb squad comes on in that last 20 minutes or 30 minutes, you've got to be able to stay on on those areas, and we've been able to do it the last two weeks, which has been great for our attack. And that's, that slows defensive line speed down as well like that collision if, if you win the collision with the carry get those quick cleans they don't have time to get set to actually put that rush um, defense pressure on so um, that that as Bryn said you know like the collision work that you know Schmidt's been focusing on and he's yeah. doing a hell of a job and, and the big boys are rolling their sleeves up man like they they're doing some uh, mighty efforts at the moment the boys in the low, num low numbers. Now that brings us to our first question um, from a viewer, Isaac October via email. You can send us an email to aotearoarugbypod at sky.co.nz or send us a question in the YouTube comments section. He wants to know about this rush defence and how the All Blacks handle it. Against the Springboks, is it worth playing without the ball? Depends on what the conditions are. I think you saw the kick strategy worked quite well for, for England in terms of that contestable. Um, and so it's an area of the South Africa are normally really good at, but they, you know, obviously the conditions were challenging. Um, but I think rush D is exactly what we sort of just spoke about. That you've got to you 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 can control it yourself by how efficient you are in and around that breakdown, but also how patient you are to to almost draw that defence out. Because rush D does come with, um, you know, you have to be really connected to do, do rush D. If one person is a little bit hesitant, that's normally the space that you can sort of pull teams apart. So I think uh, Richie Mong is in, in great form and he's sort of just orchestrating things really nicely at the moment. Mm. Bryn, when you looked at that England team and the pressure they put on against South Africa, particularly at set piece and, you know, in around those pressure areas of the game, were you surprised by how that played out, by how vulnerable South Africa looked under that kind of game, which you would think is quite familiar to them? Vulnerable, yeah, it's probably, it's probably a good way to put it. I just think the way that the, the conditions were that Jip, that Jip talked about it probably fit into England's game plan very, very perfect. You know, I think if there wasn't any rain, um, the ability to be able to hold onto the ball, the tip passes and, the, you know, the attacking um, ability that they do have, it's a lot easier to do it when it's dry footy. But the way they did in that first 20, 30 minutes, when you could see the effort areas that I touched on around their kick chase, their hard ball gets, the amount of, in that first half, three or four hard ball gets off a, off a contestable. And you could see that it was a real uh, mindset around with their contestables. They weren't necessarily trying to catch the ball. They were trying to get one hand up and just trying to bat it back to make it a contest and then dive on that ball and then being able to build pressure off that. So I don't think the All Blacks will fall into that game plan, even if it is wet. It's just very, very uncharacteristic for us. We'll probably want to hold on to the ball and still be able to win the breakdown area to then attack. But what it can show is that if it is wet or you don't have that momentum, you can go to the contestable games, which we have seen from Aaron Smith, Richard Mwanga of 10. And then also we have the attacking ability of our 12 and our 15 with Bodie and Geordie to have the attacking kick. So it's just been able to pull trigger the game management in the right moment. Moments. You know, you look at that last 10 minutes for the Irish game, we were able to be able to manipulate that with our kicking game. So we have shown that we can go in and between um, running the ball, game management uh, pressure like England do, but I think we'll have more of an attacking mindset, even if we do have a bit of rain as well. But then the last 20 minutes, the box were able to do what needed to be done. 
what was it about what the box did at that time? And do you think that that's the platform that they'll look to set against the All Blacks early rather than waiting late? Yeah, look, I think they they got their act together and, and just, you know, managed to get it home like it wasn't clinical, you know, like I think they'd probably wanted to have done it a little bit more comfortable, but it's their bread and butter. They started winning the bigger sort of set piece battles and, mm. and the breakdown and, and getting rewarded for, um, for doing so. So, um, you know, obviously that penalty that allowed them to go ahead and um, I think it was Ellis Genge mm. uh, got penalised for, for sort of not holding his own body weight, which is, you know, that's, that's sort of what you expect um, from South Africa, but it was obviously the role reversal in that first sort of 60 minutes. Mm, mm. It was, Bryn, quite a phenomenal turnaround. I, I think one of the things I'm most interested in is the evolution of the bench. And when you look at the way the box use their bench and the way that traditionally benches have been used with young guys with pace and power looking to make impact, the way they flipped that on its head and turned it into an experienced outfit coming on to close games. Yeah, well, it's, it's working. And I think the benefit of having older players is, is it's the experience of understanding game management. And you look at that at that game in particular, probably thinking with the Bok and Willem set at nine and ten, uh, at ten and fifteen, they had the mindset of you know playing with ball in hand, having the, the contestable games of Le Bok and uh, Reinick a little bit, but I think more so having that attacking mindset. But figuring it out that it was raining and it probably wasn't going that way to pull trigger and bring on Pollard at the thirty minutes is a massive call to be able to try and do that. But what it does show is that, yeah, Fuff the Clip coming on the 43rd minute, um, LaRue comes on at 45 and Snayman comes on 46 minutes. You know, they had the ability to understand, and this is why I think that um, this is a really good result for them in, t in terms that they had to change their game plan and they were able to do it. Now, yes, it wasn't clinical, but when they needed those moments to be able to try and score points, you look at the try in the 68th minute with Snyman, it went back to be able to score a try, and then Quaha makes a big play around the contest off Stewart in the 74th minute, and then it goes back to their set piece, their, their bomb score to win a game, which, you should, which has shown that for the full 80 minutes, you have to stay on for the whole time, especially coming to set piece. So um, to, to answer your question, the experience of those guys, sometimes you, you would think a younger bench would come on and be able to um, impact the game with fast footy tempo, but considering where the game was at, those decisions and bringing those guys on with that experience was was the winning of the game, I believe. And I think you've got to take their strengths away from them. You know, if, if the All Blacks look at it like not not kicking out, for instance, no less line outs, um, quick throw ins, um, you know, sort of go against where they want to go. And obviously, discipline's massive in that because you don't want to piggyback them in um, into your 22 with a driving mall. Uh, opportunity. So I think there's there's elements in, in the way the game plan can be set up for for the All Blacks that can you know really put them under more pressure, but also that frustration because that's where they want to be. They want to be in those sort of set piece battles and having that control, I suppose, at the breakdown. We've got another question in around that line outs uh, element from Joe Kudsir, uh, one of our regular question answers uh, via email. Sam Whitelock, does he start the game to challenge the box line out, considering what you saw? early on in that game against England and how the English were able to unsettle Bongyum Banabi and his jumpers? I think um, there's so much like between the three, like it probably doesn't matter as much. And I think, you know, we saw it work really well in the Ireland game, uh, Ireland test match in the quarter final. And I think, I think that mix uh, will be what's given those sort of coaches confidence. So you'd think he'll probably come off the the bench, sort of similar to what Bryn just said um, for South Africa, the older heads and, and having the ability to be sort of calm, composed in the big moment. And, you know, he, he, he had a massive play in the Irish test. And I think when teams are tiring, he'll be even more influential with that set piece team, uh, seat piece side. Um, when you look at that All Blacks bench, let's say Dan Coles is there and Anton Leonard Brown is there, you're in a similar position, aren't you, to the South Africans where you do have an extreme amount of experience of level-headed players. Well, Coles, he can be level-headed. <laughs> it'll be good for us. It'll be, it'll be good for us. But it is a similar kind of makeup. They've also evolved in that direction with their bench. Yeah, massively. And those guys are all in good form, which helps, you know, like there's good competition at training. You've, you've heard it's been a big part of their improvement um, and guys like Colsey and, and that just like Kevin Mialami played that role in 2015, mm. having players like that come on uh, in big moments, they know that they won't be overawed by it. And, and that's the sort of experience and now you need to bring yourself home if, if they're going to win this World Cup. Bryn, what's hanging over this game is the Twickenham encounter. You know, the All Blacks' worst ever loss, a couple of weeks out from a World Cup. 
the South Africans took it to them for the last 20 minutes and it really, the score blew out. Does that matter now? Considering what you've seen over the eight weeks since, is that even a factor outside of the receipts that Artie Savi has probably kept in his wallet? Yeah, I don't think you can take too much from it. I think we're a new side and I think South Africa are a new side as well. They've evolved, they bring new guys in into that group. So um, I guess the reason, the biggest problems that we've had uh, in losing test matches is getting our discipline wrong and we got our discipline wrong and not being able to adapt to the ref. But I think with Wayne Barnes coming into the, to referee that final match, it's going to be great and free flowing and um, that feel of the game will be good for both teams, I believe. Um, and if we don't get that discipline right, that's when we tend to lose test matches and the physicality and breakdown area. If we don't get that right, we know it's coming. Jip's talked about it the last two years. If we don't get that right, we don't win test matches. So again, they'll be that, that forward pack will be building confidence from the last two two test matches, but they'll know um, that they'll need to be at a, at a higher level knowing that South Africans are massive and we'll probably be going at that breakdown, especially against the All Blacks. Yeah, and I suppose it'll be interesting to see what the bench for the Springboks will be. Mm. Um, you know, they obviously had success with the seven-one at Twickenham, so that they may revert back to that and, and you know put all their eggs in that sort of big forward basket. Chuck Nenov was funny. I know they're always joking, but he was joking about an 8-0 split as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, he's uh, talking about all the different options that you could oh. go with. Can you imagine? Oh, I mean, <laughs> I mean, he was joking, but all the surely, same. Surely, surely. All the same. Mind you, Crocker could probably cover half back uh, at yeah. first five. Yeah, totally, totally. <laughs> it was interesting, though, the post-match press conference. There was some really cool insights from Sia Khaleesi into the way that the Springboks team works. Talking about Jacques Nienaba, who he's had a long relationship with, as well as Rasi Erasmus, and about how the coaches are so entwined mm. within the players' lives. They know their kids' names. They know their partners. They go out of their way to make make sure that they're more than just a coach who turns up and teaches rugby and it's created a bond within that side that gets them through the tough times. And belief, I suppose, like, it, it, you know, when a coach gets to know you on that level, mm -hmm. um, you know, it fill, fills you with belief, but then it's also belief in um, what they're trying to, you know, sort of bring and implement in terms of the game strategy and stuff. So. Uh, you can see they are a very, very close group. They've been together quite a while too now. Like they, they know each other inside and out. And, um, you know, Russie does seem like that guy everywhere he goes that uh, players love to play for him. You know, yeah. he, he's a big motivational man and um, seems to bring the, the rest of that whole coaching group together. Mm, he's got his heart in his sleeve. He loves him. Um, Brennan, also you referred to the change at 30 minutes when they brought on Pollard having that kind of bond within a squad, I imagine, allows a decision like that to be treated maturely and understood by players because there is that bond. He talked around a really important point, I think, you know, they don't talk about the players that won in a World Cup, they talk about South Africa winning the Rugby World Cup when you when you, when you leave away and it's four or five years later. They don't think about Lebok being sent off in the first 30 minutes. You talk about South Africa winning that World Cup or being in a position to win a World Cup, you know what I mean? So it just shows they the the collective list, I guess, the the real care within that team. Um, and you can see it with a lot of good teams. And I think with those results that they've found ways to win, you know, you've got a great environment if you're able to win ugly. And it just showed on the weekend, um, there's a lot of care and, um, and passion and love in that team. You can see it. I think it's also, Bryn, like, they've had his back, like, publicly. You know, when he's mm. been under a bit of the heat, they've actually come out and said, nah, he's our guy. Yeah. And I think... Because they have that, uh, he, he would have that sort of respect for them because they did have his back, that he probably wouldn't take it that personally. Like like any individual, you're going to be disappointed, but I think he'd understand why, why it happened um, and that they weren't looking to sort of shine the spotlight on him as an individual. It was just what the team needed for, for them to, you know, scrape home in a, in a semi-final. And I think you'd rather get pulled at 30 minutes and your team go on um, to win then you know, stay out there and lose and not have another week. Those minor details get lost by the wayside, don't they? The moment that trophy is lifted. You only have to look at the Black Ferns this week, you know, losing to France. We'd all forgotten the fact that they probably should have lost to France in the semi-final you know, last year, and then all the magic wouldn't have happened at all. You know? So those little tiny things kind of get lost, don't they, along the way, in the name of the bigger goal. 100%, and, and like we sort of said last week, um, you know, for all the tough heartache that the All Blacks side has been through the last sort of 24 months, you know, mm. would we accept that to be where we are and going into a final and, and if we win it, I mean, I think it would be probably one of the greatest World Cup 
um, you know, sort of victories in, in our history. Do you see that bond, you know, from the conversations you've had with players, with coaches, with people within New Zealand rugby, the way that that adversity has helped build this team, like how deep is that taken I think, bond? I think it's like just zeroed their focus. Like you hear guys like Aaron Smith, I think there's a lot of older guys that are leaving are really um, engaged and, and, and really during the week, you know, not cutting any corners and, and that intensity and focus to prove people wrong, I think has been a big motivator and that wouldn't be there um, had, had, you know, Ireland lost that series, mm. which was pretty, could have happened either way. Obviously Angus Tarvel's card really shifted that game. So, but there was a lot of uh, desire mm. to, to, you know, I suppose, take them yeah. to task and, and that feeling that that sort of receipts is yeah. they say is, is a big driving force for for their improved performance I believe the people weren't being proven wrong the All Blacks weren't playing very well so yeah. that they do they had to prove themselves right as opposed to proving people wrong if you know what I mean yeah and I feel like what they've done is actually just focused on themselves more rather than you know like what can we control and looked at their own game and, and been really focused on that rather than always looking at the opposition and, and probably over-analyzing. I feel like they've really simplified things and mm. you know, Bryn and I have said a number of times they just seem to have stripped, um, I suppose, their game plan back and, and it's, it's really based on the, the simple things of win set piece, win direct collisions, don't over-complicate that, that area and then making the right um, decisions and, and I suppose manoeuvring um, defences to allow them to show show their strengths. Well, what are you seeing there, Bryn? Yeah. Got to commend Fozzie, I believe. You know, you think around, you know, 12, 12 months ago, the kind of resilience that he's had to show with his, within his coaching group, within himself, and now you, to think about it, to be in a Rugby World Cup final, to be in a position to win a, win a Rugby World Cup where he was, you know, we've got to be able to have a give him a massive pat on the back and imagine the PR that's going to be able to be back home that Fozzie wins the championship, the World Cup, and then he's leaving as an All Black coach, you know. So well, ideally, as a kid, we want we want him to be able to win a Rugby World Cup. But I think for Fozzie as well, he'll take a lot of pride, I believe, and I think he deserves a lot of credit for all the resilience that he's had to show in to have an opportunity to win a Rugby World Cup. And then, I guess, for the powers that be, thinking that you know, was that the right decision? And you know, that, that's the great thing that we get to ask because we can ask that as, as analysts. But I think Fozzie deserves a lot of credit for the resilience and uh, that coaching group, and especially the players as well, to be able to follow him to get into a position now to win a Rugby World Cup in a final. He could be Sir Ian Foster. He, he, That'd he be, that is, be amazing thing. For it? how much heat he was under, the resilience, like yeah. Bryn said, he he's like I was genuinely happy for him. You know, after that semi final, you could see the delight on his his face because, man, it was she mm. was she was hot in the kitchen. You know, and and it all you know, sort of fingers were pointing at him, and and he he took it on the chin, um, and has just gone away and and worked quietly, made some adjustments to, I suppose, his coaching staff, which has helped um, turn this team around, and I, I think the players have taken their share of responsibility and really fronted up as well. Mm, in the opposite kind of way that you're talking about Erasmus and and Marnie Leboc, the players put themselves on the line for him. Yeah, they yeah. really did. And I suppose that's the I, I suppose the relationship he's built over a number of years. He's been involved in the All Black setup for for a long time, and and I suppose he earned that support, didn't he, through through um, those years. So, and it was the right thing to do if we go on to win this World Cup, wasn't it? So um, we we seem to be in a really good place to sort of finish off in style. I think one thing for the. The, for the South Africans, and they could probably take confidence from it. And I know they would have wanted a, a more clinical performance against the English, but they have A, B, and C options in their game. You know, you talked about it, Ross. They have that ability when they have Leboc, Willemsa, and that kind of attacking threat. They can play with ball in hand and test you that way. Secondly, they show that they can go to a contestable game and be able to smother you in that kind of DNA that they had a few years ago. They have the ability to be able to do that. And then if they can't get that right, in the last 20 minutes, if it is close, they have their bomb squad that they want to be able to scrummage you to death to be able to try and win penalties. You know what I mean? So they have a lot of plan A, plan A, plan B, plan C to be able to try and win test matches. And so sometimes it isn't as clinical and doesn't look as pretty, but they have uh, other plans to try and win test matches. So like I said, the All Blacks are going to, have to be on and all cylinders to understanding that at this time they might play like this, like that, or at the back end of a game, we've got to be more concentrated on our set piece and being able to try to dominate that area. And so for the South Africans, it's not all doom and gloom. I think that game against England, they'll be they'll be happy that they got through, but knowing that there's a lot more work and you know, they'll be a more fine polished performance, I think, in this final coming up.
One of the most incredible things about this World Cup victory is that if the Springboks win it, it will probably be the greatest World Cup victory ever. They have played five of the top six teams in the world, of course they can't play themselves, in order to win it. Mm. You know, so when you talk about the lopsided draw and those kind of things, to win this World Cup, they deserve it because it has been the knockout World Cup from hell going through every single top team. And they've consistently been at the top end for, for a number of years. So I suppose that's, you know, defending champions going back to back will be massive um, in terms of World Cup history, let alone just South African rugby. So, um, and, and first team to have four titles, um, you know, that one of these teams is going to do that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think there's a lot of excitement for both sides in terms of um, what winning this World Cup would mean for you know, the legacy of, of each jersey. And, and credit to the box, Bryn. They've done such a stellar job of mixing their squad up coming out of the quarterfinals. They had the most spread minutes across their squad, you know, whereas Ireland had played all their top 23 and they were tired. The box have done an incredible job of spreading their minutes, leaving them, despite the fact that they've played all of those top teams, looking fresh. In a finals week, you're not going to do much training. And, you know, the, the tanks will be full and ready and the... The excitement and the enthusiasm of being in a final will, 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 will give them a lot of energy as well. But yeah, you've got to commend um, Rassi and Co to be able to try and get that squad to be able to come into a final and hopefully you know, their tank's full and you're probably going to see the, hopefully the best version of the South Africans considering the, the gauntlet that they had to go through to get there. Mm. One of the key talking points that we've had along the way is the lopsided draw, right? And we've had a couple of emails which have come through in relation to this. One is from Adrian um, McDonnell out of Ireland. And what he's had to say is, if we take away the Northern versus Southern Hemisphere rivalry and look at it objectively, all four of the best teams in the world would probably be relatively even over playing 10 matches. But in knockout rugby, we see consistently the fact that the Southern Hemisphere are the ones that get through and win the titles at the World Cup outside of 2003 England team. What is it about the mentality of the Southern Hemisphere teams that gets them over the line in these games? I do think, I think a lot of it is like they've been there and done it. You know, like that, that actually feeling that success and winning a World Cup, there's so many players in um, those squads that have that feeling, they know, they know what it takes. And I, I do think that's a big part. I mean, if you look at the All Blacks versus Ireland, Ireland have been the best team well, with France, you know, for 24 months and mm -hmm. knockout game, everything on the line, it's like they just didn't, we sort of spoke about it, like you, you, it is a big factor, you know, not having an understanding. I know they uh, Leinster win a lot of trophies and they have played knockout footy, but there's always just that mental aspect to it, I, I believe, in terms of, you know, having to win these big moments and big occasions. You can't buy that experience in finals. You know, the likes of Sam Whitelock, who's going to be in his third final. Players like that have understanding and, you know, not just on game day, but driving the weeks and understanding collectively as leaders to be able to get your tank full to be able to then play in a game and all those kind of things that those players have been through and experienced um, and they've won. So, yeah, I'm with Chip around that. You can't, you can't buy the people that have been there, done it, uh, whereas the French and the Irish... They haven't had that success and knowing what it takes to be able to get into a final, let alone let alone win one. Brent, let's dig into your knowledge of this kind of stuff then at Super Rugby because he's won a few titles oh, he is. on the way. He's yes. won a few titles. Um, what did those conversations look like within the Crusaders as you were going year on year on year from title to title to title within a test, within a, not a test match, a Super Rugby final week? The weeks when you get into a final, your objective is to be able to feel, um, to feel at your best. So you obviously prefer quarterfinal, semifinal, and a final. You're preparing to obviously get into a final, but your weeks more become recovery-based, um, having more meetings, you know, the conversations that you have collectively with your inside units, your, your forward connections, your hooker, your, me connecting with Sammy or Scooter around our strategy and that. So I think the conversations just become a little bit deeper. You probably hear from a lot of teams, you know, that bone-deep prep, and it probably happens in those kind of stages. The conversations that you have, I think, are the most crucial thing around that. And so the mindset will take care of itself come Saturday. But when you're when you're having those conversations and talking around every little detail, every little thing um, that could happen in a game, a what-if scenario, for example, um, when you get into a game, you're very, very decisive. And so, and the other thing is having confidence, like the point that Jip said, when you when you won finals and you understand the confidence and you have confidence in knowing that you've done it before, 
it's another kind of um a kind of thing of positiveness that you can have knowing that you've done it. So I think those 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 few things there um come into a final um make it that much easier, I think, getting the job done, having those kind of things and, and conversations. Give us an example of a kind of conversation you had had that on final day would have actually led to something practically that helped you win. Yeah, I, I think for like what ifs, probably a lot of teams do it. I know I know a lot of teams do it. We did it, you do it throughout the year of like you, know, you play with you know, a Scott Barrett gets sent off or um, you know, there's a red card that you've got to play for like um, for, for 30 minutes with, with 14 men. So then you're talking around solutions in and around, you know, your 10s will probably drive in and around, okay, we might go to a, a four man or a five man. So when, you know, we want to have a four man line out, but it's pretty hard when you have your lock or you six someone out. So your line out, take care of yourself. The people that they need to know, your lock, your hookers, your nines, your 10s, We'll drive that, but we've already had that those kind of meetings throughout the week and understanding when if that does happen, we're prepared within that. And then it might be, you know, we might our scrum might be struggling, for example, for whatever reason. We're not getting the dominance that we want. Okay, it's just going to be a quick hook and a number eight gets out the ball. So then you take the ability of for the spring box, for an example, who have dominant scrum and want to try and get penalties, you nullify that and being able to try and um get that ball out quick so they can't get the penalty. So there's a lot of situations in different um games, but you know, one more could be you know, it's 15-15 and you have a little um, scenario within the training week of trying to set up for a drop goal and you're training those situations and those scenarios. So when you do get in those games and you are presented with those scenarios, you've trained it, you've talked about it with coaches, the players who you need to be, and everybody's on the same page and you're not kind of get a hit on the hit on the nose and you're like, oh, what are we doing now? We're prepared for everything. And so to come back to what Jip was saying, you're decisive and you're really clear and you don't seem um, frazzled or, you know, um, you can't get the job done. Is there a risk of, of thinking of too many scenarios, of, of overcomplicating it, of filling your head too much with too many what-ifs? Yeah, potentially, but you don't want to... I suppose you just don't want to have any questions in your head. So whatever, that, whatever it is for you as an individual, what information you need to seek. So like players like Bryn and I, like quite analytical, you know, we probably you know, can think into a lot more uh, questions uh, um, and there'll be some players that just want to simplify everything and go I'll, I'll just back myself on the night mm. so you just got to find what works for you as the individual so that you are calm mm. um, when, when you're out there and, and you're not sort of sucking energy from your teammates because you're panicking. I remember interviewing Ian Foster when he'd just given Sam Kane the captaincy and asking him about why Sam Kane is his captain and his response was really interesting he said Sam Kane is a very deep thinker about the game, but in a very simple way. He, he can break it down into a way that the people around him can understand and get on with it. And I can imagine having someone with that ability to think and communicate is a huge feather in the All Blacks cap going into a game like this. Massive, and, and you know, we sort of spoke about Fozzie uh, and tipping our cap to him. Like, I think Sam Kane, the way he stood up through some pretty tough times on him as an individual, he's never wavered. He's always been, you know, really, uh, I suppose, calm and composed, uh, you know, frustrated at times, but probably held himself in, in real um, high regard, I think, for not sort of ever spitting the dummy. He just, a lot of just, dignity. Yeah, he, yeah. Just, he just kept... Uh, matter of fact, and even in these big moments, you can just see the way he delivers the message. I don't think I've ever seen him yell. Mm. You know, like everything's just calm, composed. We've got this. Um, guys like Whitelock and that as well um, are, are going to be crucial in, in these big moments. Well, we'll see what happens. It should be a lot of fun. Now, carrying on this theme about the World Cup setup that we started a little bit earlier, another question for one of our viewers, and please send us an email, aotearoarugbypod at sky.co.nz or comment in the YouTube comment section. Chris Minto sent an email, and this is the best solution I've heard for the problems that the World Cup has had this year. You know, obviously there's a lot of pretty salty Irish fans about the fact that they had to play the All Blacks in the quarters when, you know, there was another side of the draw that didn't have the top four teams in the world. And they're pretty unhappy about that and they've been done hard, hard done by, I suppose, is the way that many people feel. This could be your solution. So listen to this. Petition World Rugby, because Chris Minto's come up with an absolute cracker here. He understands the logistics of needing to make the draw two years out in order to book hotels and travel and all of those things that teams need to do in order to be organized. It's quite a big process. So his idea is that when you set up the pools, you do it on those world rankings two years out. But when you get to the end of pool play and you have the top two teams from each pool go through to the final eight, rather than doing it in a 
pool setup where there are two sides of the draw. You then go to the rankings from the day before the World Cup started and you rank them one through eight. So in this case, Ireland would have been number one. And in the semi-finals, quarterfinals, they would have played the lowest ranked qualifier, number eight, and 2v7, 3v6, 4v5, and so on. So you get both sides of it. You get mm. rewarded for being consistent for four years, but also the logistics that need to be done in the first place. You know, your, your long-term performance also gets rewarded if you were good two years ago. And it makes the rankings purposeful, mm. you know, like that actually means they're doing something um, yeah. at, at a big tournament. So I think that's an outstanding idea. That's huge. Brent, that could solve everything. A lot fewer salty people around the world. I reckon we send Chris Minto off to, um, to World Rugby <laughs> and been able to petition this kind of idea. Because, yeah, I think, look, it's great. I think um, it kind of fixes all the things that we've touched on around um, the, both sides of the pool and how much has been talked about worldwide. So, yeah, I'll tell you what, that's a big tick from me. So get him over there. But he, he wanted to know what are the obstacles. Are there any obstacles that we can see in this? Because to me, I can't see a flaw. Uh, the only obstacle from a team point of view is probably planning. You know, like you, you can sort of work out who you're going to get or who you may get and, and you can sort of be proactive and, and sort of front loading from a coaching point, tactical point of view. But um, I think this idea would mean you, you're going to have to be the very best at not doing all that pre-work, I suppose. Yeah, my thoughts, maybe stadium bookings and hotel bookings might be difficult, but if you then say, OK, all of the quarterfinals, semifinals and finals are going to be in one city like Paris, you get rid of that problem. Mm. And let's face it, in the majority of World Cups, the largest stadium gets the, the biggest games towards the end. So why not? I think it's a great idea. Yeah, we're going back a couple of weeks now because we've had two questions come in in the last week about this, people wanting an explanation. Uh, Tony Forster and Rod Forster, both via email. The Aaron Smith box kick versus Ireland, when they gave away the ball with five minutes to go, or actually I think it was one minute to go and then it ended up going five more minutes because of the 37 phases. Why is that a good tactic? Well, I suppose... Um it's more Bryn's area than mine, but my, my understanding is where they were on the field, and you can you see it time and time. Teams, when they try to run a clock out, they give away a penalty. The attacking team mm. gives away a penalty, and that probably to them was like, okay, well, we can't control that, but what we can control is our defensive system and just staying, you know, sort of onside together, connected, a little bit more than. Um, the risk mm. of giving a penalty away at halfway and allowing them that entry into the into the 22 where they dominated at all time. Yeah, Bryn, from a halfback's point of view, I remember when we used to have these kind of scenarios. You're talking what ifs. If you're trying to, I guess, run down the clock and, and build that phase count, I think a minute 40, two minutes was probably the the length that you'd feel comfortable to trying to get the job done. Any longer than that, we found that would give away a penalty, someone would go off their feet if you're trying to you know, do a pillar set up when you've got going back and forth with the forwards like that. We found that that kind of time period was um, the higher it got, the more penalties you give away. So yeah, again, when you've got nines, you've got sevens, even sometimes your wingers, or especially you look at the spring box, a lot of that forward pack in general can actually get a lot of turnovers, you know? So you're very important in terms of how long you want to try and use that system. I believe it's that kind of minute and a half, two minutes is that kind of threshold of trying to close out a game like that. And I just think sometimes the best form of attack is to defend. Mm. And, and at what end of the field? Does it change depending on which end of the field you're at? Like if you were up at their 22 yeah, and you had the ball, yeah. then suddenly actually you're quite happy to hold the ball. Yeah, absolutely. So like, it was just where we were on that position of the field. It was, it was too easy for them, if they got a penalty, to kick it yeah. into the corner and maul. And we know the maul was inefficient that day. If we were down attacking in the 22, I don't think you'd probably um, even get in that setup to run the clock down. You'd probably keep playing. Mm. You'd, you'd play your structure and try and score or set up for a drop goal if you're more further down that way. Yeah, that whole taking a penalty thing this weekend, you know, we've seen different teams go with different tactics. We saw Ireland go to the corner. We saw South Africa go to the corner quite a bit as well. We saw Ireland get pay on a couple of occasions and probably third of the third occasion when Geordie Barrett did the hold up. Um, how do you see the teams going this weekend? Do you think that in a final they'll revert to being conservative 
and just get three points? I think they'll take take their points. Went, went on offer in a, in a final. Um, yeah. But if there's some momentum and they're, they're starting to feel some dominance, then that's when you'd make decisions to go to the corner. Mm. Um, and how accurate your kick is going as well. But I think early you take the points, yeah. I would. Yeah, and especially if you're down on the scoreboard? Yeah, just I just think scoreboard pressure. Um, and also, if you're behind, those small wins, you know, like don't look at it, say it's like 18-0. You, you don't want to go, oh, it's 18-0. It's like, okay, if we get three here, it's 15. That's, you know, and then so forth and you just sort of stay in that sort of present present moment um, which is which will be crucial now before we carry on we've got the black ferns and the wxv this weekend obviously it's another big weekend for women's rugby on the weekend the black ferns went down against france a repeat of the world cup semi-final <laughs> pretty much the same score line just the other way around um, so i'm keen to chat a little bit of wxv before we carry on and look at our predictions for the weekend i think we'd, <laughs> we know where that's likely to go um, so jipper when you look at the black ferns and what happened against france where did it go wrong and were there positives in there for you oh massively you know, I, I, I suppose um the way they sort of came back um but the one area that they they probably you know didn't get right is taking the opportunities they had especially in the 22 i mean if you use the first try as an example they're hot on attack in their 22 um you know lost the ball and and they go 80 meters to score so every time they sort of enter the 22 they probably didn't have that success of coming away with points each time and that'll be that'll be crucial but what I did like is the re resilience and the fight back, especially up front, man. They, they started doing some, uh, some damage at scrum time, which was, you know, you could build a comeback off that. And, you know, they just fell short, one, one, one point short. It just wasn't, you know, their night. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Bryn, when you look at that team, you know, do you think there's room there for maybe Kaluna Vale? You referred to the, the way that set piece came through to maybe start shifting her. She's been a bench player for a couple of years now. Is it time for her to get a start? Oh, look, I think those conversations can, can definitely happen. I think the impact that, you know, when they came on was very similar to the bomb squad of the South African men. I thought those girls that were able to come on had some real dominance, especially in, this, in the second half. So, yeah, I think warranted on the way that you play. Um, it's definitely something that the coaches, um, Alan Bunting and the coaches will have to think about. And But, you know, I think one of the other things that I watched, two, two things I thought in, the, in that game, you know, they had 15 turnovers to three of the French you know, so we were, if you look in the, on the attacking side, we actually had a lot of opportunities in that, especially in that first half. But the last pass or, you know, a little knock on here or there, um, we weren't able to get the get the job done there. And then, you know, the French tackled over, had two, over 200 tackle attempts. You know, so you've got to come in that their, their resilience around being able to make tackles, get off the ground, continue to keep making them. And then the scramble D as well, um, they were able to try, to try and, um, you know, slow down the, 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 the Black Ferns as well. So... A lot of positives, I think, for, for the Black Ferns, but you know, they were bitterly disappointed knowing that, you know, it was at home and the momentum that's been built up through the Rugby World Cup and, and what they were able to achieve during that that campaign. But um, a lot of stuff that they can they can get right. So, but in, in turn, for the, the French, you talk about scoreboard pressure, had two penalties in that second half to try and um, to get their points because, you know, they didn't play a lot of rugby. They kicked a lot of their ball away um, to, to build that pressure, knowing that the, the Black Ferns would run a lot of that a lot, of, a lot, a lot of the time, and I thought, especially in the second half as well, they pin them down in that 22 area a lot, and so um, yeah, come in the French and um, probably got their win back from that Rugby World Cup that they just lost by one point um, just over a year ago. The English, they looked like the English from last year's World Cup. Set piece dominance, line out drive, it looked slick. Yeah, and they've got a chip on the shoulder after yeah. losing that final, so. They've, they, you talk about receipts, I think they've probably got a couple that, that they want to <laughs> um, sort of uh, check back in with because, um, you know, heartbreaking for them. Again, similar to Ireland and France and this World Cup, um, you know, number one team expected to win yep. and win probably comfortably. Yeah. Um, and, and they didn't. Um, so they'll, they'll certainly, uh, there'll, be a, there'll be a lot of uh, set piece, I would say. There'll be a number of malls um, going into those corners. Australia weren't expected to come close to them, but I think it, for me, Bryn, it was the manner in which England went about it. You know, it was just it was a dominant, wasn't it? get out of my way, I'm coming through approach. Well, it's pretty much what they did at that World Cup, didn't it? Before they're losing in that final. Um, very good at around that, that set piece area. Yeah, they're outside backs, I think, and as well, when they have those opportunities to be able to score tries, they can score tries. So, um, you know, it was really, it's their, 
other than that one loss to the to the Black Fiends, they've been pretty dominant. They have went through that, that world record run of being able to win multiple test matches. So it just seems like they'll keep those receipts and knowing that um that the Black Ferns, you know, they're not too far away in, in a test match coming in the next couple of weeks. That test match is two weeks away. Uh, Black Ferns play Wales this week and then they play England the following week in the final week of the WXV. So plenty of good footy to go there. Jibba, we haven't talked any NPC for <laughs> two months because there's been so much rugby on. The Naki getting up against Hawke's Bay. It yeah. was a, a big, big, full crowd in that stadium, admittedly half a stadium, but a full crowd in that stadium, a great event, you must have been pretty fizzing. Yeah, oh, 2 p.m. as well, it's a great yeah. time for that sort of provincial rugby. And, um, you know, obviously my cousin's in, in Hawke's Bay, so disappointed uh, for him, but obviously good friends with Jared Hoyata as well, so really happy for the Naki. They put a lot of work into that, just their second title. Mm. Um, and, you know, they use their full squad, even, you know, Blood a few young players that are going to be, you know, exceptionally talented, um, you know, moving forward. So it was a great day for the Naki and, and a great day for that crowd that turned up and in droves. Yeah, your boy Stephen Petafetta continued to look good. At that level, he's amazing, isn't he? Yeah, I mean, they got off to a hot start, didn't yeah. they? But then they had to hold on. Um, so, yeah, they, they it was edgy a seat sort of stuff and you knew Hawks Bay were never going away. Yeah. Uh, they, they'd go to the end. But, yeah, Stevie, Stevie was a big, big factor. But... Again, um, I suppose that, that pack uh, and the dominance they got off the bench to keep that platform humming um, allowed them to sort of win that arm wrestle against Hawke's Bay. It will be interesting to see how he fares next year amongst the All Blacks duties, considering that Bowden Barrett and uh, Richie Moore aren't there. Well, it's a really good chance yeah. for him to be heavily involved. And he's going he's to be more settled in probably the 10 jersey for the Blues. Um, mm. And he, he just he looks um, you know you know comfortable at MPC level. If he can deliver that sort of dominance at Super Rugby level, then you know there's there's no reason why he can't be in the All Blacks ten jersey. Right, right. Okay, let's get back to the World Cup, eh? <laughs> let's finish off with the World Cup, the final, the big final, New Zealand versus South Africa. The two. This has probably pissed some people off. <laughs> Greatest teams in the history of rugby going up against each other. It's going to be massive. Jip, who wins and where? Um, I think the All Blacks win, um, and where uh, it'll be their defence, but also more, more importantly their discipline. I think we know both sides are going to go hard at each other in the collision areas, and I think that'll be an arm wrestle for the whole 80. But I just think, uh, you know, seven penalties on the weekend, they seem to be getting less and less each week. Mm. Um, so I, I think that, that discipline will just hopefully starve the, the Springboks of any opportunities to go into the 22 for a mall or, you know, chipping away with three points. That's interesting because, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I probably would, if you'd said that to me about discipline, I probably would have laughed because their discipline had been quite poor. Yeah. Well, they were the most penalised mm. team and then it's, they've come into the knockout stages and been very, very clinical yeah. around their discipline defensively and, and it's been the difference for them so far um, and, a, and a clear dominant difference in the semi-final. Um, and it's that, that, that discipline will be, you know, I just think both these sides are so evenly matched and uh, across the board and they have their strengths and, and weaknesses. Um, so it's just how many opportunities you're going to give the oppos oppos opposition um, will we'll decide this game. Yeah, Bryn Hall, uh, of course, a couple of weeks ago, he was all Ireland. <laughs> um, this, this week you are very much in the All Blacks camp. Where do you see them winning it if they do? Yeah, definitely. Um, with the All Blacks, the only team that I was really scared about was was the Irish and the way that they played, which we obviously saw in my in my um, trip when I was in Hawaii, and I couldn't even look at the camera. So, um, <laughs> but no, I just think yeah, the things the things that Gips touched on is going to be really important. I think the only thing that will get us in trouble, I'm going to go another way, Ross. The only thing that gets us in trouble is our, is our discipline. You know, like I said, we've lost test matches if we don't get our discipline, especially early on. You know, we give four or five penalties away and, you know, they have that scoreboard pressure of being able to tick away whether it's Pollard or LeBoc and they're getting their three points, six points and being able to build pressure. I think that's when we feel like we're under a bit of pressure. But we've got our discipline right, it seems, in this knockout stage. But, you know, they'll be planning for those what-if moments if they, if they don't get it right. But I think being able to, to stop that bomb squad, I think, in the last 30 minutes will be massive as well. If the game's close... I think we've had enough, um, or we've shown enough with our bench coming on that we can, um, we can nullify that and be able to stop them to try and win um, set piece penalties, be able to build scoreboard pressure, get into that 
22 meter zone and being able to go to the line out more or building with their with their forward pack. Um, I feel if we get those things right, um, you know, it'd be a good result for us and the points that Jip touched on as well. Do you think there's a single New Zealand or South African pundit out there who's going to cross the fence this week? <laughs> no, absolutely <laughs> not. I think mean, everyone's uh, firmly on their bandwagons. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's going to be a doozy. I'm seriously, seriously excited for it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Are you you're counting the hours? Oh, yeah. 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 I might even watch the third and fourth, even though that's a, a meaningless game. But it's just more. It's been a great world. It's been a great World Cup, man. It's it's been so good for the game of rugby, I believe. Mm, okay, well, let's talk about the third and fourth. Who wins that test? Um, I have to go England. I think. Uh, just uh, Argentina. Just they just weren't there, were they? Um, I think physically they might be a little bit drained, and um, you know, it's a hard week though, isn't it? Like, <laughs> it's it's yeah. it's a tough game to have to play. But yeah, I think I think England will get it done. Yeah, and that'll be a good statement for England. There, there, there's a lot riding up from their point of view. To finish third is a real mm. boost for the for, for the players, and I suppose Steve Borthwick, you yeah. know, who was under immense pressure after that Fiji loss, and, and they've just they've just chipped away quietly, and that they were seconds away from uh, you know yeah. doing the unthinkable in the semi final. You know, Steve Borthwick and co, they had a pretty clear DNA of what they wanted and leading into the Rugby World Cup, we were pretty, um, you know, we, weren't, we weren't speaking fondly of them, let's be honest. We thought they weren't going to go too well at the World Cup, but they stuck into their DNA, they, they trust in it. And it's, um, you know, some people say it's not a great way to play rugby, but with the, the team that they have and the way that they do play, they execute it beautifully. So I think for, for me as well, it's probably a really tough week playing third and fourth mentally. I don't know how you would have, would train for that week. You'd have your trainings and whatnot, but the intensity, I believe, is probably a lot different than you would have in a semi-final, knowing that a final's on. So, it might be a case of whoever's there mentally and being able to really stay in it and being able to get you know your heads your heads right, knowing that it's a third and fourth, and you probably don't want to be there to be honest. Mm, the All Blacks in that third fourth playoff against Wales four years ago, they went down the path of changing up their fifteen. There were those guys like Ryan Crotty, mm. Sonny Bill Williams, Ben Smith, who had been overlooked, and a lot of people in the country were like, "Why on earth are these guys overlooked?" And they had something to prove for themselves yeah. as well, didn't they? So uh, that seems like a fairly healthy way of going. I would suggest that's what England will do as well. There's still plenty to prove. That's why I think a lot of those players will want to suit back up and, and rip into it, um, you know, to, to make that statement. Whereas Argentina, you know, like there's, there's opportunity to maybe give a, a start to like an Augustine Creevy and see um, if, if that one-two punch can... I suppose, spark them, because he, he's a man that has a lot of passion and, and seems to be able to bring people with him. And probably might be the end of his career. Yeah, I can't imagine yeah. him going to another World Cup. No, no. So, so it, but, you know, like, if you can find little little milestones like that to sort of lean on in these weeks, it'll be crucial. Yeah, absolutely. No, thank you all very much for tuning in once again to the Aotearoa Rugby Pod. We're looking forward to an incredible test match this week. Get in touch with us at Aotearoa Rugby Pod at sky.co.nz and leave us a comment in the comments section on YouTube and we'll try our best to answer you next week, which should be an incredible episode with the winner of that title to talk about and how it went down. So, once again, thank you. James Parsons. Cheers, mate. Bryn Hall over in Japan. Another big week of training for you, mate, before the big World Cup final. Yep, definitely is. We've got camp coming up, a 14-day camp, so, yeah, hopefully <laughs> get some smiles before you do that, so no, it's going to be good. Looking forward to it. <laughs> Bryn will be running laps at halftime oh, during the, um, mate, during the World it, Cup It final. gives me fear that he's talking about it being too much running because the guy loves and lives to run. Yeah. I, I can only... <laughs> begin to imagine the load. Yeah, yeah, it sounds sick. Yeah. Absolutely sick. Okay, well, thank you very much to all of you for tuning in once again to the Aotearoa Rugby Pod. We'll catch you next week. Matewa. <laughs>